All right, we're live. So welcome back to DAP University. So today we're going to talk about uh, some crazy stuff that's happening on the Ethereum platform. Right now, we've got Layer 2 scaling solutions that are heating up. Uh, we got some new developers in that space, which are you know working together to try to bring the future of blockchain technology, a very decentralized, fast, scalable world computer um, that we can use to you know have as a, as a settlement layer for the entire world. It's kind of the promise of blockchain technologies. We're going to talk about some of the developments in that space um, in this video. We're looking at a lot of the news updates that have happened since our live streams that we do uh, yesterday. Again, we do these live streams Monday through Friday on this channel about 9.30 a.m. Central Time. Just turn on notifications, uh, subscribe to the channel. You'll find out about those whenever we go live. We're going to check on the crypto markets, answer some of your questions, and a lot more. So if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to become a blockchain master step-by-step start to finish, then head on over to adaptiversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. So we've got lots of people jumping in the chat here. Sorry, my live stream setup's a little uh, messed up this morning, so I'm trying to like troubleshoot things as we're getting started here. But we got people jumping in the chat. Uh, we got Culture Eyes. We got Automatic Beats. We got Piano Man. Uh, Just Kaz. Um, let's see. Some of these names I can't pronounce off the top of my head. Sorry, everybody. Uh, but welcome, welcome, welcome. So let's just go ahead and get started here. Let me uh, let me pull this tweet up here on my screen. So, uh, yeah, let's talk about Layer 2 scaling solutions for Ethereum. So, r quick recap, if you don't know what I'm talking about. So, basically, you know, one of the biggest complaints about Ethereum is it's too slow, it's too expensive to use. We see lots of other, um, you know, uh, uh, smart contract platforms pop up, try to fix this problem. You've got, um, the, the ones that even have smart contracts right now, we've got Solana, we've got, um, you know, Avalanche, we've got others coming onto the scene try to remedy some of this problem. Um, but one thing that a lot of people aren't aware of is that scalability is coming uh, for Ethereum basically now, okay, with Layer 2 scaling solutions. And you don't, have to, you don't even have to wait for Ethereum 2.0 to fully roll out before you can get these benefits, okay? Um, because Ethereum 2.0 will do uh, quite a bit to improve the scalability of the Ethereum blockchain itself, but it'll be a while before we get those benefits. But, but, but essentially right now we can get those benefits with layer two scaling solutions um, on top of the Ethereum platform. This is essentially where you build a second layer on top of the Ethereum platform and you uh, basically settle the result of those transactions on top of the main Ethereum chain, or at least they derive their security from it. Some of them work differently. Um, but the, the major players that we've been watching this space is for, in terms of true layer twos have been Optimism and Arbitrum, okay? So these are two different optimistic roll-ups technologies. Basically, optimistic roll-ups are a way of what I was talking about a second ago, where you take, you batch up transactions off-chain, you perform a lot of activity there, and then you settle the final result on top of the Ethereum uh, layer one chain itself. And so we have some uh, news in this space. Uh, about a hop protocol, all right, helping the withdrawal times for optimism. Okay, so we got some other news about uh, other scaling solutions here. I'll talk about in a second, but let's talk about what problem this is solving and why this is such a cool, um, why this is such a cool development. So one drawback of layer two scaling solutions, uh, or at least for optimistic rollups, is that they have this delayed withdrawal period. Okay, there's, there's different types of layer twos out there. There's optimistic rollups. There's zero knowledge rollups. They all have different. Uh, trade-offs that they um, make in order to achieve scalability. All right, every blockchain that promises that we have, you know, we've we've cracked the scaling trilemma, they're usually making some sort of trade-offs. Um, and so I try to be 100% upfront about those R so that you know what you're getting into before you try to use the tech, okay? So um, with optimistic rollups, basically there's a withdrawal period and by default it's seven days. Now I've talked about how that's, you know, a deal breaker for a lot of people. But there are ways to improve this. And so we have other players coming in the space uh, to try to mitigate that seven-day withdrawal uh, time. So that's exactly what HOP protocol is, okay? So Ethereum is scaling and HOP is bridging the gaps. Say hello to Hoptimism, the first fast bridge connecting Optimism uh, to Ethereum and other scaling solutions. So transfer assets in and out of Optimism in minutes. So you can get on the HOP exchange and do that. So, of course, this will have also its own set of trade-offs in order to uh, facilitate and speed up these types of withdrawals, but we're still creating the pieces of the puzzle that can be put together so that this, this problem can be made better, at least in the short to midterm. Now, in the long term, um, 
you know, uh, we do have the ability for zero knowledge based scaling solutions to come onto the scene, which will won't have these withdrawal periods. We have to circumvent with you know different uh, pieces that have to be created in order to do that. Uh, but the trade off here with optimistic rollups, the, one of the things reasons that we see so many projects launching on them, them shipping so soon, is because you can just take your apps with minimal code changes and put them on optimistic rollup scaling solutions. Whereas some of these zero knowledge based solutions, and sometimes you have to completely rewrite the application to work on those, um, you know, those well, in that environment. Okay, so. That's one of the reasons those are going to be delayed. Also, the actual implementation of the scaling solution is a bit more complex. Um, so those are the, some of the factors that while we're not seeing those just immediately roll out and gain the adoption, at least I don't think right now. That's my that's my perceived uh, reason. Okay, so um, that's what's happening on the optimism front. We are seeing you know uh, adoption happening in this space. I'm going to see if I can pull up the Uniswap charts. So. Um, there's a there's a site that I use to actually track the liquidity on Uniswap version three. Let's see, Let's see if I can find it. If anybody has it in the uh, chat, you can drop it in there. I'm gonna look at it here in a minute. But anyways, that's going on the optimism front. If I find that other uh, link, we can look at what's going on with Uniswap version three here in a minute. Uh, but another thing to watch out for is. Uh, you know, talking about the layer two scaling wars heating up. Of course, the other major player in in the uh, optimistic rollup space is uh, Arbitrum. Okay, and Arbitrum has their uh, official um, release this month. So let me just pull it up. So let me just pull it up on the screen here. So Ethereum Layer 2 Scaling Solution Arbitrum launched this month. All right, this is from early this month, beginning of August, and I guess right now we're at August um, 26. So I don't have a firm uh, date on this, um, but it should be within the next several days. Okay, I, I think maybe, I think maybe the last date I saw floating around was August 31st, but don't quote me on that. Uh, but anyways, so Arbitrum, the Layer 2 roll-up, uh, has announced it will launch mainnet beta this month, opening services to regular users who want to issue projects uh, using the scaling solution. So, it's until now, Arbitrum had been operating in sort of a sandbox of more than 250 projects applying to build using the optimistic rollup tech. Arbitrum will allow users to transact almost instantly with negligible fees, aiming to satisfy mass adoption. So, I'm talking about the war that's heating up here because. At the end of the day, a lot of these layer twos are really going to be competing with one another. Okay, and that that's that's kind of the, the truth. Um, and we're gonna it's gonna be a battle to kind of see which one sort of wins out. A lot of times you'll see you know uh, technology enter into the scene in blockchain. And they'll say things like, "Yo, we believe in a multi-chain future." Uh, you know, where there's you know, room for many players and all this type of stuff. And really what they're saying, they're trying to justify their own existence and to say, well, hey, we deserve a seat at the table too. I'm not saying that's what these particular solutions are doing. Um, I just see this a lot with other, you know, competitors come on the scene. They, they're like, oh, we, you know, every, every, you know, there's, there's room for everybody when really they're trying to say that you should take us seriously. Uh, but anyways, that's what's going to happen with layer twos is basically they're, they're eventually going to compete with one another. Because at the end of the day, what you don't want is uh is liquidity for DeFi applications and, and blockchain like completely fragmented everywhere you don't you don't want like 10 layer twos um that have like you know 10 percent of the liquidity in each different layer and then you have to move from layer to layer if you wanted to sell a large amount of cryptocurrency so for example let's say that uh you had a new uh, cryptocurrency launch on top of ethereum and you wanted to transact in layer two let's say it's a DeFi token okay and then let's say the market cap is only like um, like $10 million or something like that. And then you take the actual amount of liquidity, which may only be like 10% of that entire market cap, and then you divide it up among 10 different layer twos. Well, your slippage on a DEX is going to be insane, even if you wanted to trade like $1,000 of that particular token. And so it, effectively, that's unusable for, for many people. Um, who are kind of getting into DeFi, all right? Like if you were to trade, like let's say you let's say you bought a token for ten dollars and then it did a a ten x or sorry hundred dollars and did a ten x, you want to sell it for a thousand dollars? That's a really small kind of use case. Um, you you may not even have the, the correct amount of slippage uh, to 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 get out of that trade profitably. So that's just one example of why you don't want a bazillion layer twos and why I think we're going to consolidate around 
you know, a handful of them. I do think it's it's good at the end of the day to have some options, okay, when you're talking about a layer two, not necessarily uh, in terms of, of the actual blockchain itself, but in terms of layer two, I think it makes sense to have some options because at the end of the day, you don't want complete centralization around a layer two. But um, realistically, I think that means that you're going to have just a handful of them. That's what the market's going to prefer in the long run. Um, just because of the fragmentation I talked about. And network effect is huge at the end of the day. It really is an expression of network effect. You want to go where there's the most activity because if you want to move between layer twos, there's still a pain. Like you have to go through a bridge process. Uh, You'd have to pay to do that. And the best scenario is you just sort of have your preferred environment that you stay in almost all the time. And then you just transact within that ecosystem. Um, that's what the market is likely to demand, and so we're going to see kind of who is who's first to do that. Um, yeah, it's crazy. So strap in. We're going to find out. <laughs> this is one of those things that's incredibly hard to predict, um, and it's 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 the, the really what you have to do is, is watch things play out in real time. So this is this is somebody says one inch is the best dex. Yeah, I like one inch. But it's also a Dex aggregator. That, that I think they do also their own uh, their own liquidity, but that's kind of what they're known for. So what is add liquidity? That's when you go to Uniswap and you add a liquidity pool or you join a liquidity pool. Somebody says if they sign up for the monthly membership program, will they get access to the live class today? The answer is yes. So we are uh, doing the Flash Loan Masterclass today, so you can sign up. I'll put a link down in the chat below uh, or in the description below after this call. Uh, that'll be tonight at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. All right, so let's check on let's check on the <clears throat> crypto markets really quickly. All right, so I'll pull up the Bitcoin charts here. Let's see here. I'm not sure why, but on TradingView, my preferred Bitcoin feed is like not showing up whenever I search the Bitcoin price. Um, so I see a lot of people kind of like freaking out about Bitcoin price right now, overall crypto markets, thinking that like, you know, uh, it's it's like dipping and it's losing steam, losing momentum. Um, like I said, I, I keep going back to the idea of um, kind of where we're at with the fundamentals and what the momentum is doing for the entire space. I'm still leaning in a bullish direction. Um, I mean, I wouldn't start asking questions about this until like, you know, Bitcoin decides to break down significantly below these long term moving averages um, for an extended period of time. OK, so I'm still leaning bullish. Uh, again, we are seeing pretty kind of low volume uh, on Bitcoin, especially compared to where we've been for you know, several years here, or at least over the past year, year and change. Uh, that being said, I mean, I think a lot of new money that's coming into crypto is flowing into other things, uh, particularly Ethereum. So let's pull it up. And also, I mean, other alts for sure. Um, let's just look at the ETH price. So same sort of story. I, I think the entire crypto market, uh, in terms of the majors at least, are, are all experiencing this dip right now. Um, yeah, let's see here. Yeah, the ETH price is leveled out. Uh, looks pretty flat. I mean, ETH kind of tends to do this. Uh, so depending on which direction the market decides to go, uh, I think we'll see a kind of a significant move in either direction. So if Bitcoin decides to flip bullish, if the entire market decides to flip bullish, I could see ETH being pretty ready to make some make some cover cover some ground quickly i'll put it that way that's kind of ten that tends to be how it, it trades based on its history how i've watched it you know you know day in day out for for quite some time now all right so let's look at um let's look at a couple other pieces of news i saw fly across my feed yesterday so speaking of um you know, Bitcoin. Yeah, we talked about 
We talked about institutional adoption of cryptocurrency being a massive uh, catalyst for this entire market uh, over the past you know, year and change. Uh, we do see more news of that coming down the pike where we saw Morgan Stanley just reported owning a large amount of Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Right, The largest of these appears to be 928,051 shares held by Morgan's Insight Fund. Okay, So this is big. I mean, of course, Morgan Stanley is a massive, massive, massive player. Uh, and their exposure here to Bitcoin is through the Bitcoin Trust for Grayscale. So if you're not familiar with Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, what it is is basically um, they buy Bitcoin um, and then you can get exposure to that by purchasing shares of a trust. That's that's, that's how it works, okay? Um, and we see other people getting exposure to Bitcoin this way. I mean, Grayscale has gotten pretty famous for, uh, you know, kind of trying to time the you know predict what's going to happen with the market based on the grayscale premium when the unlocks happen all that type of stuff some of it's just been way off when people try to predict the markets those way that way but it's it's, it's really significant um you know trust in the space that, that a lot of people are, are using to get exposure to bitcoin at the end of the day whenever you have these big institutions getting into the game a lot of them are not just like buying <laughs> like getting on coinbase uh or binance or, or kraken or whatever uh, Gemini, and then basically just like creating an account and then just like clicking market buy for, <laughs> you know, like like millions or billions of dollars. Uh, they're getting exposure other ways. And this this is a pretty popular method. Uh, it, it's probably easier for them to account for on their balance sheet this way by owning shares of a trust rather than, um, you know, custodying crypto cards. It, it, it's probably easier. I'm sure they're paying a premium for it, but there's lots of reasons why. Uh, I'm not sure what they all are. I'm just kind of guessing, but there's lots of reasons why they're doing it this way. Somebody just out of curiosity, where in the smart contract you put your ERC-20 token image? Where do they come from? So typically speaking, the images for ERC-20 tokens uh, are not contained inside the smart contract itself, okay? Um, that's usually just something that people pull from like a centralized uh, cryptocurrency price website API or something like that. Um, so for example, like CoinGecko, is a website where you go check on cryptocurrency prices like coinmarketcap.com. Uh, many of these websites have uh, external APIs. Uh, so if you don't know what an API is, basically it's like getting access to a website without using your browser. Like if you want to build an app that talks to CoinGecko, you use their API, which basically is just like the, the back end part of their web server that you make requests to uh, with your own app. Okay. And so these APIs have endpoints. Those endpoints have, uh, you know, certain parameters and have certain responses, all that type of stuff. Um, and so if you're going to get images, a lot of times you would just like talk to an API from a website like CoinGecko.com. And a lot of times they'll have, uh, you know, like some data about the token. Like they'll look, tell you the current price, tell you the current market cap, the smart contract address if it's an Ethereum-based token. And then many times... Um, it'll have a URL like for the token image itself. Now, I'm not 100% sure that CoinGecko actually has that information. I'm just using an example. Um, there's probably other uh, websites that have the uh, image for the, um, have the image for the, the token itself. Now, that being said, so how do you get your token image out there? Um, well, at the end of the day, there's going to be some legwork on your part as the token creator to you know get it out there now a lot of people a lot of people will like on websites like coin gecko they have some sort of process where they they want to have the they want to have good data and so when they list new tokens there's a strong incentive for them to like find what's popular so they're going to see what's you know actually has trading volume what's listed on exchanges and they're probably just going to list the token um, and then find whatever the image is. I mean, you can add... So here's the other thing. Okay, so I should have mentioned this in the first place. Um, with Etherscan, you can go through a verification process uh, where you actually like submit data to Etherscan, prove that you created the token, and then submit metadata about it. Like on Etherscan, if you go to the thing and you see like uh, what the metadata about the token is, like the website and stuff, like let's just pull up a, some random token. So, 
having a hard time connecting to Etherscan. I wonder if it's the DNS or if it's just the actual website. It's probably just the DNS. Okay, here we go. So let's look at the uni token. I know I'm kind of going long on this question, but I want to be specific, and I'm sure other people have this question, so let's just let's just knock it out. Um, okay, so if you look on Etherscan, you can see that like uh, there's a bunch of data about this token, Uniswap token, right? So it, whenever you create it, of course, you have the name, the symbol, the decimals, and the smart contract itself. That's how the ERC-20 standard works. You have to have that information. Uh, but you have all this other info like um the official site the social media profiles um you have the token image right here so what you can do whenever you go um create a token on etherscan first you want to verify the token source code so you go to the contract um if there's no verification there you just like take your source code and you just paste it in there um and then you create an Etherscan account and you go through and you like say, I forget where the setting is, but it's like, you know, submit info or something like that. Um, and you just go through the process and then somebody at Etherscan actually like verifies that it's you, all that type of stuff. And then you can uh, add all your token data, like the image and the uh, branding and the social profiles. And then there, Etherscan will sort of be a centralized source of information and people can look up your um Look up your image from there. Is there a way to collaborate with masterclass colleagues? Yes, totally. So that's what the uh, that's what the membership option grants you. Is it grants you access to the uh, the the community chat that's part of the blockchain mastery program? So basically, anybody who chose that option um, and is also part of the blockchain mastery program is in that chat. Somebody says they uh, bought the blockchain developer bootcamp a few days ago. Great course. Awesome. Awesome. So is there an application that is uh, compulsory for tokens on Etherscan? I guess I'm not sure what you mean by that question. Somebody says, have I tried Ethereum Waffle? If so, is it comparable to Truffle? Uh, I know what you're talking about. Let me just pull it up. So, I actually haven't used this, but maybe this is a good source for a video. So, I tend to... Uh, you know, one one thing, I, I do like to try new developer tools from time to time, uh, but at the end of the day, typically, unless things offer a massive, massive, massive advantage to something that I already use, um, I typically tend to, you know, use with what works. And I, I honestly recommend that quite a bit for beginners. Like, one thing, one big mistake that I see a lot of beginners make, um, it's not a huge mistake, but it, it's just a kind of senseless time waster is they want to like try every single text editor, they want to try every like terminal configuration, they want to try every single font. They typically jump around between too many programming languages. Um, you know, it's kind of like you get a little uh <laughs> you know, get a little distracted that way. I'll put it that way. Try a bazillion frameworks. Um and so there's there's lots of cool stuff that comes out all the time and that's some some things people just love to do. Um and sometimes you can, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I just don't tend to do it that way. I mean, I've used the same text editor for a long time. <laughs> I'm kind of a creature of having that regard. But typically, a lot of the reason why is not because I'm, I'm not opposed to change for change's sake. I mean, I adapt to the changes in blockchain technology all the time because you have to. Uh, typically, I just don't. Change always has a cost. And there's, to, to me, you know, it always takes time and energy to adjust to those things. Um, and to me, that time and energy, I usually get a higher, higher ROI by spending it on other things. Somebody says Waffle uses chai, not different than truffle. Awesome. Somebody says, uh, I upload my token info to BS scam uh, or Binance scam. Well, how, how do you pronounce it? Took three weeks to get a reply saying they would not update the info unless we had white paper and devs are docs. <laughs> Ouch.
Somebody says E3.0 will fees go down. So not natively, really, on the actual blockchain itself, but with layer two scaling solutions that they, they definitely will. So one thing that's really interesting, I've actually got a video uh, coming out pretty soon about this um, because there's been a lot of hype about Avalanche lately. Um, so one thing that's really interesting is, you know, with, with, with the layer twos, uh, you're going to get a lot of scalability because layer two is going to be part of the long-term vision of Ethereum, even with uh, ETH 2.0. Okay. So like we're going to have layer twos basically now. Um, but as we transition to ETH 2.0, they're going to stick around. All right. That's one of the reasons that the scaling war is heating up. And so you're going to get a performance benefit that's going to be quite high, but also preserve decentralization. Um, because I did a video about this. Uh, it'll probably come out next week. Let me just pull up. Um, let's just pull it up here. It's to about, you know, we have all these smart contract platforms that are popping up, basically trying to say like, hey, you know, we're... We're faster, we're cheaper, we're sort of the golden solution for smart contracts long term, but there's typically some sort of sacrifice that they make, okay? Um, and there's been a lot of hype about the Avalanche project lately. And honestly, the biggest reason for that hype, in my opinion, uh, is because there's all these like liquidity mining incentives over there. People are just chasing gains. So it's like, oh, awesome, a new place where I can go like uh, get in early on pumps, I can get in early on big yield farming rewards, and the transactions are cheap and they're fast for now at least. Um, and so I can kind of go in and get out and bridge. And also there's a decentralized bridge. So you can, you don't have to KYC through exchange. You can just go over there, um, you know, do some quick DeFi activity and then like get out. And I think that's probably what's going to happen with Avalanche to tell you the truth, uh, at least a short to midterm. We saw with Binance Smart Chain where people were just like going in and kind of getting in on the pumps and then like leaving. And you can actually see that in the transaction volume for Binance Smart Chain. Let's like look it up. Uh, like you can actually track the... You can track the daily transactions. Something you can see it like they spike like crazy whenever something happens, and then it's like kind of like a ghost town. Whenever uh, not ghost town, that's so that's too extreme, but uh, you know it goes through these hype cycles, right? Whenever whenever something big kind of happens, it's not like long term, just like trending upward. So like you know with Avalanche, you can watch the whole video to see it. Uh, at the end of the day, like I'm not. Uh, I don't care what blockchain people use. Uh, you know, something like a Binance Smart Chain, Avalanche. Uh, all these people are basically like uh, configuring their environments where people can take Solidity applications and uh, put them on the network live and they're EVM compatible, except for Solana. Solana is based on Rust. Um, so I don't really care. Like, like everything that I've talked to you on this channel, you can typically use to build your own applications to the ecosystems. Um, but I always want people to be aware of the trade offs that are being made here. So with, with Avalanche, I mean, they talk about like, you know, um, Talk about sort of the big benefits of those ecosystems. Let me pull up the actual website. And there's probably gonna be people who are just like absolutely trolling in the chat or like, oh, you're wrong, blah, 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 blah. But uh, if, if you're gonna say that, then like <laughs> tell me exactly how. Because um, I'm open minded, but here's what I think is gonna happen with Avalanche ecosystems. So basically, they talk about having like 4,500 transactions per second, you know, less than two second transaction finality. Right, but they compare it to ETH 1.0 right now. Um, and if you look at the validators, um, you know, Avalanche has about a thousand validators right now. Um, but you can also do delegations at the protocol level. So here's what I think is going to happen. Like you, you and, and the, they also talk about how it's a big deal for Avalanche that you can run on consumer hardware for a validator. So if you want to, you want to run it and you want to stake then basically like you can just have a, a fairly normal computer and do it like you only need a handful of gigs of ram you need like 200 gigabytes of, of disk space um but the, the 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 real catch here is that these benefits aren't going to last forever okay um for two reasons number one what happens when you have a blockchain that's going to allow you know four thousand five hundred transactions per second throughput and then people actually start using it well the size of the actual blockchain state itself is going to get really really big um and then you're not going to be able to run it on consumer hardware anymore and then if you have delegated staking at the protocol level this number right here 
this this ratio of people delegating to stake their cryptocurrency versus actually running validators is going to get skewed dramatically. Because at some point, people are going to say, well, hey, I'm not going to run this validator anymore because the state is so big and unwieldy that it's getting way too expensive or I'm just not going to do it or it's not performing. So you're going to have people delegate their stake, not actually stake, which is going to, it's going to significantly compromise the decentralization. This is just what I think is going to happen. And then probably what's going to happen is... Uh, you know, you got 4,500 transactions per second, less than two-second two second transaction finality, but if the ecosystem actually takes off and a lot of people start using it, then the fees are actually going to increase as well, okay? So, you know, there's low fees because there's relatively low activity. And so if you compare those fees, so basically what I'm saying is that if it takes off, then the benefits will likely disappear, and then the benefits relative to a mature technology uh, that's more decentralized and faster and scalable, it's not going to be as competitive, in my opinion, okay? So we'll have to wait and see. Again, um, you know, this just kind of helping you think through this here. And so if you compare that to like ETH2, for the deposit contract, we already have 218,000 validators uh, on a blockchain that, you know, it's not even really being used right now, okay? ETH2.0 is still getting set up. We already have 218,000 people who are running validators compared to, you know, or not people, but actual validators themselves compared to 1,000. So it's that's significantly more decentralized. There's no actual delegation at the protocol level. Of course, you can do staking pools, but at the end of the day, you still have to have skin in the game to run a validator. You can't just back out and delegate your stake. So this is way more decentralized. Uh, I know there's going to be what people who are running multiple validators here, um, so that's the other thing. And then you're, you know, if you have something that's way more decentralized like this, that's actually fit for a more global settlement layer and you have fees that go down significantly, um, with, uh, layer two scaling solutions on top of it, it, it it's really that something like this is going to lose its competitive advantage. Now, that being said, and then day, I don't care what people use, I just want them to know what they're getting into. Okay. Um, because sometimes this stuff is not always advertised honestly okay we're not uh, you know it's only up front with the trade-offs that are being made so that's what i want to do is is help you be aware of those trade-offs um and so uh yeah that's what i think at the end of the day i don't care what you use uh you can take everything i've talked to you on this channel about how to develop for ethereum solidity smart contracts and you know put, take your own app and launch it on avalanche but by, by all means do, do that if you want to but that's what i think is probably going to happen is we're going to copy see a hype cycle and then uh you know, it, it'll probably get a, a flurry of attention for a while um, and then sort of evaporate whenever the gains disappear. That's kind of what happens with these ecosystems. All right, so let's see here. Probably some angry people in the chat. <laughs> let's just, let's take a look. All right, so let's see here. So this is how can I start with blockchain development? Go to my YouTube homepage and find uh, the the video that says how to become a blockchain developer in 2021. That's a great summary. So the graph is a cool project for sure for indexing blockchain data. So this is Solana looks like it's shaping it to be a major player. Yeah. So it's 32 ETH, a lot of a regular crypto trader. I mean, 32 ETH is, it's about a hundred grand. So it's it's a lot of money for a lot of people, for most, most people, vast majority of most people. I mean, crypto things are kind of relative. <laughs> you get you get random whales in crypto. You don't always know you're talking to a whale when you're talking to somebody in crypto. Somebody says low fees on AVAX is the most expensive. So how much would E2.0 reduce gas fees? So I talked about this a minute ago. Um, E2.0 in and of itself is not going to do a lot to lower the gas fees. You're really going to get that with uh, layer 2 scaling on top of Ethereum. It's a good question. So we've seen trends on EIP fifteen. So have we seen trends on gas price, gas fees? I feel like the gas has been up since EIP fifteen fifty nine. I understand the network activity plays a part, but I feel like it's been crazy. Yeah, so it has been crazy. 
part of that's been the NFT craze. Part of that's been wallets and users kind of adapting to EIP-1559. All right, everybody, that's all I got for today. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so that more people can learn about blockchain. You know, if you're as fascinated with this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? Well, you can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find any of my free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a massive shortcut entirely, I can show you become a blockchain master step-by-step -step, start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got, and until next time, thanks for watching, Dad.